everyone, and welcome to Freedom is the Cure, where we aim to show that whatever the societal ailment, freedom is always the cure. I'm Paul Dragoo. Thanks for tuning in. So a few years ago, my doctor sent me a text message with a link to a series of presentations called The Constitution is the Solution. At the time, I was living in a quiet but gritty Montana town just 40 miles south of Canada, an area where the cows are as plentiful as the stars in the prairie night sky and the people as tough and stubborn as the winters. My doctor was one of those people. He was a naturopathic doctor, so he was stubborn by profession. But he was also vehemently opposed to what was accepted as, as conservatism. And a large reason for his views, I'll later learn, is because he understood the U.S. Constitution. He liked to point to government edicts and say that they were unconstitutional and therefore unenforceable. When COVID tyranny began, he was instrumental in helping people realize the limitations of government power and our duty as citizens to help educate local officials on what they can and cannot do. I ended up watching the entire six-part Constitution series that he sent me, and that kicked off a journey that helped me realize just how far we veered from the founder's original intent for American government. That text message not only changed how I saw American governance and what was wrong with it, but it eventually whisked me from the Montana Prairie to the Wisconsin woods to work for the most dedicated and stalwart patriotic organization, the John Birch Society. In this episode, I have the distinct honor of talking to the man who created and gave that series of lectures. But before we dive in, please remember to follow our social media and podcast channels and like and share this episode. Like with most truth tellers, Big Tech has restricted our message big time, and we need your help in spreading the word. So Robert Brown is a former field coordinator for the John Birch Society. He is a constitutional scholar and a dedicated patriot who has devoted valuable time and resources to helping people understand that the Constitution is the solution. Robert, it's an honor to have you here on Freedom is the Cure. Well, thank you. It's always fun when I get to come out here and visit with all the great people that help run the John Birch Society. So many essential roles happening here, many great people that I consider it's an honor to be able to rub shoulders with and even collaborate with on various projects. Yeah. Like yourself, it's great to finally meet you in person. Yeah, we've talked a bit off, even though we communicate on, on and off the phone, so it's always, there's so many, like you said, so many Birchers running around doing things all over the country, but it's always nice to, to meet in person too. So before I dive in, I want to tell you, I actually got a, I had a phone call yesterday with a member uh, in Florida, and he, you know, throughout the conversation, we were working on something else, uh, but he had mentioned that he puts on a Constitution is the Solution uh, class every Wednesday at his church. So uh, there, there it goes again, and you know, we have these all over, and uh, that's, that's what we're talking about today. So I guess I wanted to ask you, it's like, how did this come about? Uh, what made you create this uh, series of lectures? That's a great question. A little bit of history here. I'm going to start with kind of my, what I call my origin story, where over a dozen years ago, a friend and neighbor of mine invited me to a class on the Constitution, which he informed me was going to be held in my living room. <laughs> and so I attended. Yeah. And yeah, no choice. Yeah, of course. He had arranged this with my wife ahead of time. But uh, the reason I start there is because that was transformational for me, yeah. kind of similar for yourself. In this course that we went through, I learned really three most important things. Number one, we're really not following the Constitution in any serious manner today. Yeah. And number two, if we were, if we were following it strictly as written, as intended, I concluded that it would probably solve the majority of problems our nation's facing today. And then number three, why are we not? And that I concluded was, we the people don't enforce the rules because we the people don't know the rules. Yeah. And yet that's our job. I, I often refer to Mattis, or excuse me, Hamilton in Federalist 16, refers to the people as the natural guardians of the Constitution. And yet we're totally unprepared for that role if we haven't studied the Constitution, if we don't know what is and what is not constitutional. Have, has there, you know, that was going to ask you, you saw my questions before, but I was going to ask you, um, is there constitutional illiteracy? And clearly there are. Has that always been the case? Or uh, That's an interesting question as well, yes. And 
My favorite example of this, has our nation always been constitutionally illiterate? Yeah. The, so the answer to that that I found through the years of study was surprising to me, really. From Alexis de Tocqueville, French philosopher and author, he wrote Democracy in America. In there, he came to America around the 1830s to discover what was our secret to yeah. our overnight success, becoming this world economic power mm -hmm. and so on, almost overnight. And he pointed to a number of things, but the most notable that I took away from this was that in America, every citizen is taught the history of his country and the leading features of its constitution. Yeah. He goes on to say, it's extremely rare to find a man who's not perfectly acquainted with all these things. A person wholly ignorant of them is sort of a phenomenon. How bizarre. We found someone that doesn't know all about uh, their history and the constitution. And today, it's exactly the opposite. Well, how were they thought this? Because they didn't have public education then. Is this something, yeah. was it thought in the churches? And he parents, talks about that as newspapers. well. And it was all of the above. He, in particular, he does mention the churches from the pulpit and yeah. so on, that they really advocated and taught the history mm -hmm. and, as well, the Constitution. They advocated for various politicians, candidates in upcoming elections were talked about in church from the pulpit yeah. and so on. They didn't have this whole 501c3, you can't talk about these things or whatever yeah. else then. That's been really problematic. Yeah. And again, kind of getting back to your original question, as I began to recognize that's the great deficiency mm -hmm. in our nation. We, the people, don't know the rules. We, therefore, cannot enforce the rules. And it became my mission to do everything I could, to help. in my small way, to rectify that, at least to some degree. Yeah. And so I began hosting classes on the Constitution. And to be, to be honest, the course that I was awakened with, I felt was a very good course but that it wasn't the right course. Yeah. What I was looking for was a course designed for the activist to teach us what we need to know to draw the line between what is and what is not constitutional and what to do about it. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of went on a mission at that point to find the course. And I went through so many different courses on the Constitution, <laughs> never finding the course. And reluctantly, I finally concluded... I got to make my I'm going to have to make the course. And, and at first... I tried to get the John Birch Society to do it <laughs> and have someone else be the face on this yeah. series and We're so like, on. Nah. And ultimately, when you have a passion to make something, it's probably going to have to be you that makes yeah. it. So that's eventually where it came to, was I'm going to have to make this course myself. What are you finding? I take it you're still, you know, in your when you're available, when you can, you, you're still traveling around, you're still mm -hmm. putting these... Um, what are you finding? Are you still finding... Is, is there any indication that... First of all, are people more excited about learning it, or is it the same? And are they still as illiterate? I take it that may be the case, because that's probably why they're doing what they're doing. Well, obviously, one thing that I'm really grateful for and amazed by is the degree of success that we've seen with this course. It's yeah. been all across the country. Thousands of people have purchased and held courses on, on the Constitution through my Constitution is the Solution. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, many people have learned the Constitution through it. But by and large, as a whole, the American people still are woefully ignorant of this. But on the other hand, the other thing we're seeing is as things get more difficult, as we see more violations of our liberties coming from state and federal governments and so on, people are more ready. They're more hungry. They're open. Yes, to, exactly. To, to, to solutions. And so right now is a time to really strike while the iron's hot, so yeah. to speak, because your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers, whomever, many of them are starting to really look for solutions. How did we get, going back slightly before we go to the next, how did we get to this point? You know, there, you mentioned at the beginning there, there was everyone, there was great, great literacy, knowledge about it, and now obviously we're quite the opposite. What kind of happened in between? Yeah, here we are almost 200 years after that, yeah. that statement from Tocqueville. And there's been a lot of things we could point to. Obviously, number one, the churches are fairly silenced on the matter. They don't mm -hmm. talk about principles of liberty, the Constitution, our national history like they used to. Mm -hmm. For the most part, there are some out there that are brave and do so anyway. Uh, what about our public schools, though? I remember a number of years ago, my niece brought to me her high school history book and showed me, you're a constitutionalist, I want you to look at the chapter on the Constitution. And we looked at it together, and I said, oh, that's not right, and that's not, that, that totally misrepresents, and so on. I finally concluded, it would be better if your class skips that chapter. 
so that you have less to unlearn. Wow. <laughs> because it was so bad. I don't remember what, if anything, I learned. Well, I, I remember. I guess I don't, and I so I don't know what I learned about the Constitution. To tell you the truth, <laughs> you know, ironically, I wasn't that interested in high school. Yeah, either. that's 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 why I think it may not be fair to make that assessment because I wasn't very interested in every in anything in school. So, <laughs> but also when you take from history all the great lessons and and really many times miraculous occurrences like happened in our War for Independence, yeah, it becomes so plain and boring. I've often taught classes on. The miracles that made America, for example. And one of my favorite comments, somebody came up after that class and said, if you had been my history teacher, I would have loved history. (laughs) Because when you see that Washington, for example, wrote back to Congress accounting for miracles that came to their aid, just blatantly, this was divine providence intervened on our behalf. More than 50 times he accounts for various miracles that were just so obvious, no one could deny. That was the hand of God. Yeah, that was We can't a, talk about that in the schools. We can't talk about that in the media hardly anymore. And yet that's what makes history so rich and fun to learn is to hear about the various things that really did happen rather than just memorizing names and dates and whatever else, which gets anything. very boring. What what are some of the most common powers that people believe the federal government has but actually doesn't? <laughs> <laughs> All of them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, that, that one's such a huge topic. I mean, you, you look through the federal department of... Right. And almost all of them are unconstitutional, whether it be the Federal Department of Education or Health and Human Services or... And on and on. There's so few actual enumerated powers. It would be a much easier conversation to say, what are they authorized to do? But and, it, it, how do they get to... The, I mean, is it a matter of twisting the interpretation? How do they justify this? Yes. Well, a little preview, I guess. Lecture number two of my course goes into five excuses for unlimited power. Mm -hmm. And then there we talk about things like the necessary and proper clause, for example. That Congress shall have the power to do anything that shall be necessary and proper. And if you stop there, well, that sounds like they have unlimited power. Right. I once had someone share that with me saying, see, Congress does have the authority. It's right there. They have power to make do anything necessary and proper. I said, would you mind reading the next seven words, please? For carrying into execution the foregoing powers. Oh, wait a minute. So that's not, they have all power to make any laws necessary. It's any laws necessary for this list of enumerated powers. Oh, that's suddenly a very limited power. Yeah. But when you take it out of context like that and just read, well, this is now called the elastic clause Mm -hmm. because they figure they can stretch it to fit any power they need because of that narrow reading of it. They didn't read the whole context. Yeah, that's very common. And there are several clauses within the Constitution that they've done that with that honestly are disingenuous applications of the wording that's in there. There's no reasonable argument to claim, for example, that the Necessary and Proper Clause really is a broad grant of power to do anything they feel necessary. Right, which they've done, though. And um, do you find that a lot of people, when you break this news to them, it's like, oh, by the way, the Department of Education, the Department of Energy... The Department of Health and Human Services, none of those are constitutional. I get two, two <laughs> reactions to that, depending on where they are, I guess, mentally, politically. On the one hand, those that feel like, yes, that's great to have the federal government far less involved in our lives. And I, I appreciate that response. But it's not uncommon to have people say things like, but it's so needed. Who would watch over these issues if the federal mm, government wasn't yeah. doing it? And for that... We hear that a lot. My favorite quote from Washington's farewell address, he talks about, if in the opinion of the people, the disposition or allocation of constitutional powers be in any particular wrong, in other words, if we didn't give them the power they needed to have, let it be corrected by the amendment process. Yes. And not by usurpation. For though this in one instance may be the instrument of good, it is the customary weapon by which free governments are destroyed. So going back to their argument, it's so needed. Well, if it's so needed, then we need an amendment to the Constitution to formally and properly grant that power through the constitutional amendment process. We don't just steal the power because we feel like it's needed. And as as Washington said there, for though this, in one instance, might be the instrument of good, it's the way in which free governments are destroyed. Yeah. 
That's what is happening, is this usurpation. We see something that, oh, maybe the federal government needs to do this. Maybe it doesn't. We never have that debate on whether or not to ratify an amendment granting it to them. They just take the power and start doing it. And, and I imagine most people don't even know that we were designed in a way where the states were supposed to have more power than the central government. But this was always, yeah. correct me if I'm wrong, this was always an issue, right? The, 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 how much central government power should there be, right? You have, oh, yes. Just going back to our early history, before the U.S. Constitution under the Articles of Confederation, the states were so jealous of their power and not allowing the central government to have power. The Articles of Confederation were really recommendatory. There was no power in them. Yes. Congress had duties, but no power. They could recommend to the states, I think we should do this or that, and the states could choose voluntarily to do so or not. This became a huge problem in our war for independence against Great Britain when Congress had the task of organizing and arming our, our military mm -hmm. to defend ourselves against the British. They couldn't tax to pay for it. Right. They would beg the states, please send funds in for the war. We've got to provide our, for our troops' needs. And the states would raise some taxes, spend some money, and hey, if there's anything left over, maybe we should send this over to help Washington out with his war. It didn't work. So it was almost like little countries. Kinda, yes, kinda, loosely were, tied with a, an agreement yeah, to collaborate. Which is how the Constitution did eventually come about, right? The, that the, is the exactly right. Use. So when they recognized the Articles of Confederation were inadequate mm -hmm. and that we really need some national enforcement power, if we're going to have a central government in charge of these things, they need to have the power to do the things we're asking them to do. So then we have the... Constitutional Convention of 1787, in which they created hybrid. Now, they defined the terms federal and national as two different things. Today, we use them interchangeably. They're not the same thing, though. Federal, they defined as this is voluntary participation. It's powers left to the states. National, the national government has some enforcement power. And they created this hybrid that in the list of enumerated powers, the federal government really has national enforcement power. But then by the 10th Amendment, anything not on that list is left to the states or right. the people. So it's partly federal, partly national. And then since that time, it's become more and more national. And the federal leaving to the states all the other powers has really been diminished. The state's power has shrunk as their power shrinks as the federal government takes more power to themselves. Yeah, that's... Now, speaking of that... Would the tyranny that we've lived through the last couple of years, this, this COVID stuff, if we were to have adhered or adhered to the Constitution's original intent, would any of that look different? Whether yeah. how states reply, uh, responded or the government's uh, recommendations? Yeah. There... That's a huge topic. I'm going to touch on it somewhat briefly, <laughs> yeah, yeah. more brief than maybe Briefly is all we deserved. got time for. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's fine. And, you know, on the one hand, people will often say things are unconstitutional when they recognize it violates principles of liberty. Yeah. But under the U.S. Constitution, the states were free to do a lot of things that the federal government was not. Mm -hmm. So certain things might or might not be within state power. But separate from that, I want to focus on, when we're talking about constitutionality, the U.S. Constitution. Yeah. And in that regard, well, what there's... the federal government did in response, I think, is where I want to focus my Yes, my, yeah, yeah. My There'd be no here. DPHHS, for, for right. instance, right? Now, that's So a we have no point. Fauci sitting up in... There's no Fauci. There's no gain-of-function research. There, yeah. And would it have ever been a pandemic in the first place? Would there be a CDC? No. Yeah, there shouldn't be a no CDC. CDC guidelines. No, no HHS. Fauci. No, yeah, so there's no national guidelines. There's none of this. Yeah. Well, this that, sounds like chaos, Robert. Who's going who's gonna to take care of us? It's called freedom. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, Thomas Jefferson talked about he'd much rather hazard the dangers of too much freedom mm -hmm. than go through the, the tyranny of too little freedom. And that's a very rough paraphrase. He said it much more eloquently. But I totally agree with that, that a little bit of having a little too much freedom is really a good thing. Can we handle too much freedom today? And now one of the, one of the things here, and that, that's a great question. I wanted to expand on that question. If the federal government wasn't involved in our schools and healthcare and all these different things, it doesn't mean it's not going to happen. 
It doesn't mean we won't have schools. Right. It doesn't mean we're not going to have health care. It just means it's not their jurisdiction. Right. Which was, it was never in the first place. It was never supposed to be. And if things were in state jurisdiction or even local jurisdiction, it creates much more competition. Let's take, for example, the Obamacare, as it's nicknamed. National Health Care Act. Yeah. No constitutional authority to have that. I'll, I'll go against the Supreme Court on that one. But what it was supposed to be is on the state level, if at all. And, of course, Obamacare was modeled after Romney Care, as it was nicknamed, Massachusetts, Massachusetts version, which was a failure already, and they still decided to model it after it. Mm-hmm. If, instead of that, we had allowed competition between the states, keeping this at the state level, let's say, for example, that Wisconsin looks at the Massachusetts model and say, well, that didn't work very well. Let's do a different model that at least doesn't bankrupt the state. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> Literally, right. Massachusetts had to get bailouts from the federal government to keep it going. It was that bad. And so let's say Wisconsin comes up with their model that is at least financially stable, still not perfect. And then, of course, my state in Utah, we come up with the even better model that starts bringing health care costs down. And, and other states are looking at the three models, and well, the Utah model is better than the other two. And then, say, Arizona comes up with one that even improves upon Utah's and so on. That competition is healthy. Whereas one size fits all for the entire country, and we're going to make that one size the failed model out of Massachusetts. That's exactly the worst way we could do it. Well, without like a competition, they, there's no reason to improve. I, the DMV is always mentioned. Why is the DMV? The DMV is the only place, right, you can get your driver's license and all this stuff. There's no other place. And so you walk in there and wally gagging <laughs> around, there's a big line. And I think that's really reflective of what happens when there's no competition. And that's why everything, nearly everything by government is run so badly. There is no competition. They have nothing to lose. Your taxpayers yeah. are going into their pockets regardless. It's, it's, it's tragic. Um, one of your lectures is, what is it, the enemies, exposing... Exposing the enemies of freedom, yeah, yes. I, I wanted to touch slightly on that uh, because this was one of the... When I got to this episode, I was like, I felt like I wasn't alone. <laughs> <laughs> you know, here was an articulate uh, presentation. Uh, no tinfoil hat on your head. Uh, you made some some great points and... It really resonated. It's like, yes, that makes sense. I've always, I don't know at what point I realized there is a whole lot more going on. There really is. This this new world order, this one world government thing, this isn't, uh, it's not just a crazy conspiracy. In your travels, uh, and as you continue to do this, are you finding that more people are realizing this is what's happening. There is a plot. There is an elite group of international folks working to implement this. And this plays a huge role in the usurpation of our rights, of, of our state's rights, of, of, of the deterioration of the Constitution. Yes. I want to talk about that for just a moment. This is fascinating to me because when I created the Constitution as the Solution series, this was 10 years ago. And at the time, Coming into the topic of conspiracy, I did it very gently, very gradually, building up to and establishing a foundation for it so that this isn't coming across as some tinfoil hat, crazy conspiracy theory stuff. In fact, one of the first things I talk about in Lecture 5, The Enemies of Freedom... Conspiracy fact, right? Well, yeah, exactly. There's conspiracy theory, there's conspiracy fact, and we need to be careful not to get caught up in the speculative conspiracy theories, Mm -hmm. but we are firmly grounded, keeping our feet on the ground on well-documented fact, because there's plenty. Like reptilian aliens. That's pretty well documented. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going there. But yeah, and that's one of the examples I give of, this is a little bit more on the speculative conspiracy a little. theory stuff. Just a little <laughs> bit. And yet there's so much out there that is well-documented mm-hmm. of a global agenda to create one government to rule over the entire world, right. regionalization leading, leading to globalization and so on. Now, the reason I mention this is I really go through lecture four and the beginning of five to build up that foundation so that when I start talking about conspiracy fact, it doesn't shock people. Today, I feel like we don't need nearly that much buildup because people are beginning to see this all around them. They're beginning to see that there's corruption. The deep state, for example, is now a very common phraseology mm-hmm. where that was something that was very foreign to us even 10 years ago. Trump and has so, helped a lot. Yeah, that, in yeah. that regard, we've seen so much where people recognize media corruption. 
is all around us. Yeah. Government corruption is all around us, Propaganda, the deep state yeah. and so on. So this idea of there being conspiracy fact is no longer such a taboo topic that's something you have to walk into very gently and carefully and really lay that foundation. If I were to make the Constitution series again today, it wouldn't have nearly as much buildup to establishing there is a conspiracy yeah. in the world to take your freedom. Yeah, pretty much everybody knows that yeah, now. Yeah, I can see that. Especially over the last couple of years, we've seen that so abundantly that it's just not that foreign of a concept anymore. Are they... Do they have more questions about it now? Like, how does this work? Because it seems like, I'd imagine, like, now people come with various assumptions around what it is, not necessarily if it is. Right, right. Exactly right. And really, the importance of this is when you're seeing crazy things happening over here and over there from different elements of government or whatever, when you understand the big picture is when it all starts to make more sense. And so that's, that's some of the major value here. When you understand the big picture, number one, everything starts to make sense. But number two, it, has, it helps us have a better idea of what to do to stop it. Mm -hmm. If you know what their actual agendas are, you understand that regionalization, like the North American Union push from 2010, for example, right. that that was part of a much larger agenda. Knowing that, well, it makes sense what they're doing. And knowing that, we have a better understanding and rally cry to help stop it. How would you describe to – we had someone from the media come in a couple of weeks ago, and, and I always feel – I mean, for, speaking for me, I always wonder, it's like, man, did I describe that as best as I could? Because you got to talk in, in, in very short nuggets, and, and you only have this much time and this much of their p attention to, to bring about the point. This is what it is. So if you had like a couple of sentences to describe the conspiracy, how would you do it? <laughs> wow. Right, it's tough, yeah. see? Yeah, it is. It is. And really, I would play off of what they already know. When we talk about deep state, that would probably be where I'd start. Because we've heard a lot about the deep state. What is it? What is the real agenda behind it? In a couple minutes, you could at least bring up that topic mm -hmm. and not be some foreign concept yeah. and have a little bit of a conversation on that. And, and we really have done that already just now in our conversation here, that the deep state agenda, if you want to call it that, is really globalization. It's to transform the United Nations from really, they're kind of that recommendatory body, kind of like the Articles of Confederation established. Mm -hmm. And they want to grow that into being an actual government with a military power behind it and to disarm the rest of the world so that there is no one country that has the power to say no to them. Right. That's really what it comes down to. That's probably the most concise explanation I can give. And there's plenty of documentation behind all of that. And I'd imagine, going back to our topic, that the Constitution is a threat to global governance, Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Right. Now, uh, I don't want to finish this before we touch on the, another threat to the Constitution, which is from within, mm -hmm. I would, we would agree, and one that you are very involved in trying to stop, and that is the threat of an Article 5 convention. I'm going to start out with this because a lot of people are like, why would it be in there if we cannot use it? And if we should not use it now, when, considering we're on the verge of, well, it's pretty rough out there, as you know. Yeah. <laughs> and that's a great topic. I definitely want to get into that a little bit. The, the topic of an Article 5 convention, in Article 5 of the U.S. Constitution, talks about how we can make changes to the Constitution, amendments. Mm -hmm. And two and we ways. Have. We've made We've made many 27, yeah. including the Bill of Rights. All of those went through the first method, which is Congress proposes the amendments. The Article 5 convention option has never been used, and I, I would say rightly so, for good reason. The Article 5 convention, when two-thirds of the state legislatures apply to Congress for a convention, then Congress calls a convention for proposing amendments, and then it goes out to the states for ratification. But based on historical precedent from the 1787 convention, if you try to call this convention for a limited purpose, like, say, term limits, mm -hmm. we're going to limit them, they can't talk about anything else, that's how they try to sell this to our yeah, state yeah. legislators— Historical precedent says eh, you can limit them any way you want. It's not going to work <laughs> because the 1787 convention was given limited authority to create a federal form of government, and they created a more national one like we started off talking about today. Admitting, you know, we probably don't have the authority, but it's essential that we do so. And so that convention set this precedent that give them limits, they don't have to follow the limits, 
and they can change the ratification process in, the, in what was in the Constitution. They totally replaced it. This movement is a deep concern. I don't say that an Article V convention is by itself an evil thing. It never should have occurred in the Constitution or whatever else. I, just, I often describe it, it's like a gun. It's a very powerful weapon. And in the right hands, it can be used for good, but in the wrong hands, it can do terrible destruction. Uh, and, and what are the wrong hands? People who are ignorant of the Constitution, mm. people who don't know what's already in there. If you don't know what's in the Constitution and you're starting to propose changes to it, you're likely to do more damage than good. I highlighted this point in a debate I did about a year ago. I was debating some of the Convention of States bill sponsors in the state legislature in Utah. And the question came up, why don't they have a balanced budget requirement in the Constitution? They, they admitted, my opponents, I have no idea they should have done it. My answer was, because they have something better. Rather than a balanced budget requirement, the founders gave us the enumerated powers, which refines all government spending to this short list of powers. And anything outside of that, they are not authorized to be spending money on if the federal government were trimmed to fit back in the box the Constitution actually authorizes. It would trim the federal budget by roughly 80%. You'd have around $2 trillion surplus annually. We'd begin paying down the national debt. And isn't that better than merely balancing the budget? That's... We... I... You know, depending, I've talked to some folks, and and that's the number we always were, were throwing out there. And it's so crazy that I think a lot of people they may listen and hear this and be like, it might just not register. Because let's let's reiterate that if we were to adhere to the Constitution, eighty mm -hmm. percent of the federal government would not exist. Yep, and that would more than balance the budget. Yep, right at current tax levels roughly $2 trillion surplus in our taxes annually. <laughs> That's huge. <laughs> How in the... and, and my point is this. Yeah. There are people out there pushing, we have to have a balanced budget am amendment to the Constitution. I I'm saying, no, we don't. We just need to enforce what's already there. And it gets us far beyond merely balancing the budget. And what is their answer to this? There's no way, there, we're, there, there's no yeah. way it's happening because how are you going to convince... I'm glad you brought up that question. How do we get this to happen? Yes. How do we get back to the Constitution? It seems like a pipe dream, right? To, I mean, it, it not to us. Yeah, it, it certainly can. <laughs> I would say probably the most important lecture that I give is called The Power of 500. And you can pull that up on YouTube or on shopjbs.org. Yeah. The Power of 500 describes how just a few hundred people have the power to rein in their congressmen. I... This isn't just theory. This is what, when I was first hired by the John Birch Society back in I'm 2009. I'm so glad you brought that up. Yeah. I went to Montana to implement the Power of 500. That, they said, we've got you for a special project. We're not just doing regular coordinator here. You're here to implement this program. Our congressman at the time, Denny Reberg, had been following the Constitution, according to our Freedom Index ratings, around 50% of the time. I went there, started teaching the Constitution, handing out his voting record across the, across the state, and getting others to do the same. Let's educate on the Constitution. We produced my Constitution course, started publishing his voting record from the Freedom Index everywhere we went, and within four months, he got his all-time best score ever, 80%. And his next score after that was also 80%, and we kept on him. And every mm -hmm. time he'd hold any town hall meeting, we'd make sure we'd have people there to hand out his voting record. Because <laughs> without fail, every time we did that, the questions would be focused around the constitutionality of his voting record. All right. And that by the third report that came out, he got a 90%. And I showed up to the next town hall meeting. Congressman Reberg, I want to congratulate you. You just got your highest score ever, 90% constitutional rating. You're among the elite best scores in the entire country. So it works. It works. Pressuring and letting And we know only had work. a couple hundred people doing this program. And I have to add, at that time, Montana was the largest population congressional district in the country. They're right on the verge of getting two, and they now mm -hmm. have two yeah, congressmen yeah. now. Mm -hmm. So this, if I could do that there... In one of the largest geographic and the largest population-wise yeah. of all the congressional districts in the country. Granted, it helped that it wasn't Nancy Pelosi's district. That would take a lot longer. 
Mm -hmm. because the socialist leanings of the population support what she's doing. But in any district that has somewhat of a conservative leaning, it's almost an overnight fix that, wow, these people naturally recognize the Constitution should be followed. Once they recognize he's not, Mm -hmm. it's an easy transition to get them to start speaking out against his voting record. Well, that that brings a a sad and interesting point, which is that they have to, we have to help our legislators who you would think should know or they had considered a priority, but they don't. It's only priority if we make it. This is, again, why, when I quoted Alexander Hamilton, the people are the natural guardians of the Constitution. Yeah. We have to know the Constitution, and we have to, I've got to use this word, from James Madison, Federalist 46, he talks about the disquietude of the people. Disquietude, I love that word, disquietude. What does that mean? And it's really the people are speaking out against what you're doing. That's exactly what we did with Congressman Mm Reber. Disquietude was raised among the people about his voting record and how it squared with the Constitution. Right. I could have called it the power of disquietude, but it doesn't have the same ring as the power of 500. So we <laughs> right, went with right. that. Well, we're glad you did. We, we, uh, we advertise, of course, we, we try to push the, the power of 500. And I think you made a great point that that is how you do. You get 500. If you get 500 birchers really active in That's a right. district, is it any district? It doesn't matter how. Uh, I grew up in You'd Atlanta. Some of these districts. Yeah. <laughs> Millions of people in some. I'm going to I'm going to refer to Nancy Pelosi's district. <laughs> it will be a harder road there, mm-hmm. guaranteed. Yeah. Can you make progress there, though? I'm sure. I'm yeah. sure you can start getting progress even in the more liberal Marxist districts, or you might get shot. I don't know. <laughs> well, <laughs> as a sidebar, there, I've talked to some of our folks in California, and I'll tell you what I'm hearing is that having a front row seat to that chaos, to that Marxism, yeah. to that tyranny has awakened a lot of folks there. And of course, we, the John Birch Society, used to have a lot of influence out in California, and, and we got great folks out there. So, so, so there's hope. And I want to circle back that, to that prognosis, that hope too. But before, I, before we go there, I want to make sure to reinforce, because with the CONCON, one of the most common questions or rebukes that I'm sure you hear as we hear on our end here is that, okay, okay, no balanced budget, no term limits, all you, you know, no, no, no. That's all we hear from you. It's like, well, what is the solution? You already said the solution, and right. we want to solidify that. The solution is you, right? Absolutely. Is educa- the Constitution is a solution. We have to know what it says because then we hold them accountable, right? My little catchphrase there is, when we the people understand and demand adherence to the Constitution, it will be followed. That's really what it comes down to. I will say that there are really two prongs to this attack. We the people expressing our disquietude Mm -hmm. directly to our members of Congress, House and Senate and so on. But it also comes down to, at the state level, encouraging our state leaders to make a stand as well. And this is where things like nullification come in. Those are both things that were heavily talked about in the Federalist Papers. I'll list very briefly Federalist 16. I thought nullification was racist. (laughs) Oh, I could nail that one. That'd be a fun one. Because nullification, when it comes to slavery, we see no record of nullification being used to promote slavery, but we do see it significantly used against the, uh, what were the laws called? The uh, fugitive slave laws from 1850, for example. 13 states of the northern states passed nullification of the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. And it became such a frustration. In many states, they, once a slave got into those states, there was no way, even if you caught them, there yeah. was no way you could get them back into the southern states, back into slavery, mm. because of this nullification. So it was heavily used against the unconstitutional fugitive slave law. Yeah. So there is that. It's also, we really need to awaken our governors, our state legislators, that this is their duty when they swear an oath of office to uphold the federal constitution. That when the Constitution is being violated by the federal government, that's when your oath matters. Yeah. It doesn't matter when everyone's following the Constitution. Well, yeah, so am I. It's when it's being tried, when it's being tested, whether or not you're going to follow it. Yeah. That's when your oath matters. That's why we swear in any office in government, why we swear an oath of office to uphold the federal Constitution. So the good news is, is that it's up to us. The bad news is that it's up to us. Yes. <laughs> What's your prognosis? Last question. I have to say, times of difficulty 
create far more support, far more interest. As we're going through the last few years, the tyranny that we've seen rear, rear its head so much more obviously than in past years. Mm -hmm. The more that happens, the more people wake up, they're concerned, they're looking for answers, and this is the opportunity for us to help guide them into effective action. I, I saw this with the Tea Party a decade ago. The Tea Party group was awakened, they were concerned, they ran every different direction trying to figure out what to do. Those that found effective action yes. are still in the battle now. Yeah. Those that were spinning their wheels, not accomplishing things, doing all kinds of things that didn't work, got burned out and left the, the battlefield. And so that's why the John Birch Society is so important. Decades of experience directing groups into effective action so that you don't burn out, you have victories that you can look back to in your history. You remember when we accomplished this and that, we defeated this, we got this pass, and so on. That's what keeps somebody that's been awakened yeah. to continually be an activist ever after. Absolutely, absolutely. Robert, thank you so much. Thank you for, again, your, your series, your lectures, and we look forward to the uh, new edition. Um, we don't know when that'll come out. but <laughs> Coming soon to <laughs> yeah. a home near you. <laughs> and uh, we thank you for all your work. Thank you. Well, folks, the Constitution is a solution. Thank you, Robert Brown, for your terrific presentations and all the work that you do to help people learn that. And thank you to all the JBS members and supporters who put on Constitution is a Solution workshops all over the country. We just held one here in Appleton, Wisconsin, and members are holding them all across the country, as we've already mentioned. Here at the John Burr Society, the Constitution is our guide. It's our compass to the positions we take, and to those we oppose. We believe that as more people learn the Constitution, the greater our chance of national restoration becomes. The more we adhere to the Constitution, the freer and more prosperous we become. If you haven't seen Robert's series, we've made them available online. You go to jbs.org. Or you can order the DVD series. Check out the link below. However you do it, please watch this important series and please share it with as many people as possible. JBS founder Robert Welch liked to say that education is our total strategy and truth is our only weapon. After God's help, the Constitution is the next biggest primary weapon against tyranny. It's an amazing document, a bulwark against an oppressive government. Lastly, if you haven't joined the JBS in our epic undertaking to restore America and save the world from a totalitarian one-world government, it's time to join the fight. Time's running out. Reach out to your local coordinator to get started. We've provided a link to help you connect with a local coordinator below. And until next time, remember that whatever our societal problems, freedom is the cure.